Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. go here we are with episode number 45 of the principles of performance podcast i am your host eric degatti and i am flying solo without my co-host today mike perry because he is off we're recording this on a holiday because i really wanted to get this guy on and wanted to make sure that we didn't miss the opportunity our our guest today is alex hutchinson i'll give you a a quick background on him uh, if you're not familiar with him Uh, he's an author and a journalist he's written for a bunch of different stuff some really interesting stuff from popular mechanics uh, where he earned a a national uh, magazine award for energy reporting to adventure travel for the new york times he was a runner's world columnist from 2012 to 2017 and and the globe and mail and uh, and now he's writing for Outside Magazine, where he's a, uh, an, a contributing editor and he writes the Sweat Science column. And his primary focus is the science of endurance and, and fitness. And so I got to know Alex's work through a, a book that I stumbled across uh, a couple of years back called Endure, uh, Mind, Body, and Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance, which is a, f- a fascinating read. And we're going to go deep into a lot of the stuff that I, I, I want to ask him about from that. He's also written a couple other books called uh, Which Comes First, Cardio or Weights. Uh, and then he also has an, uh, another book, uh, Big Ideas, uh, 100 Modern Inventions That Have Transformed Our World. So some interesting stuff. But some of the, the interesting stuff I also didn't know about you, Alex, is when I did my homework here, uh, he started out as a physicist and has a PhD. PhD from University of Cambridge, and then uh, did a few few years of postdoctoral research work for the U.S. National Security Agency. Um, so we won't ask you for any top top secrets here today, but was working on quantum computing and nanomechanics, not our typical guest here. Um, But during that time, he competed middle and long distance uh, as a runner for Canadian national team, mostly as a miler, but also doing some cross country stuff and some mountain running. Uh, And he's still doing that most days. Actually, we had to push back the the interview a little bit because we had a little bit of a stumble, I understand, in in one of of your running. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thanks for the the nice intro and also for the, the opportunity to be here and chat. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So the book Endure, it's a great work. It's rightfully gotten a lot of acclaim. And it's it's interesting that when you look up the definition, which I did uh, in preparation for this, it actually says two things that I thought were interesting, both to suffer something painful or difficult patiently, very, very eloquent there, as well as to, to last, remain in existence. So how much of what we label as endurance is just the ability to be comfortable being really uncomfortable? Yeah, I mean, I think the way you phrased it there, be, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, it's it's kind of, I guess it's caught on in the last three or four years. I started to, I've started to hear that more, and I think it's a great way of encapsulating what it's all about. Because, I mean, in the physiology literature, there's you can have all these definitions of, or there's actually squabbling over, you know, what is endurance? Is it events that last continuously for more than three minutes, or is it, you know, maintaining a VO2 max above such and such a percent of your to- or a VO2 of such, but you know, you can get quabble with, quibble with the physiological definitions, but ultimately what we're talking about is something that takes place over time, right? Like if I punch you in the face, well, that'd be a bad move for, uh, I can see right uh, just for, for on the zoom screen, that would be a bad move. But if, if you, let's say if you punch me in the face, that's going to hurt me, but it doesn't require any endurance on my part to be punched in the face. Uh, it, it, it's, it's doing dealing with something where you have an opportunity to pull away and you don't, and you choose to, to lean into that discomfort, I think is the, the sort of essence of endurance. Now is, is part of that before we go on to the next question, you know, as part of that um, and how well you can deal with that is part of that knowing that it's going to end at some point, 
you know, like, you know, I've, I've gotten the opportunity to, to do some workshops on some military bases and gotten to see a little bit about what the SEALs do with training. And part of the mystery of, I don't know where that finish line is, it adds a whole nother psychological, psychological element, as opposed to, if I could just get through this drill at the end of practice, it'll be over, right? Yeah, the, knowing the endpoint is is so important that there's a whole field of study called teleo anticipation. Telos is the Greek word for endpoint or fi finish, anticipation of the finish, and and trying to understand how that influences our experience uh, or, or the way we experience something. And so, they do studies in the lab where you know you put someone on a treadmill, you tell them they're going to run for a certain amount of time, and then just when they think they're finished, you you know say, oh, just kidding, you need to go for another hour or whatever, or another ten minutes or whatever the case may be. And what you can, you know, you learn a lot about this. And one of the things is, is that when people don't know how far they're going, a given effort feels harder, right? At the get-go, like let's, I put, you put me on a treadmill, you set it at a given speed. If you tell me I'm going to have to maintain that speed for half an hour, I'll say, yeah, this, this is reasonably comfortable. It's seven out of 10. If you tell me, just go until I tell you to stop. And I don't know when you're going to stop. The exact same physiological effort feels harder to me. I'm saying that's eight out of 10 It's nine out of 10 because I'm scared that I may have to keep going forever. And so that, you know, this plays out, you know, every local 5k run, you know, when people turn the corner and see the finish line and start sprinting, all of a sudden they thought they were really tired. They thought they were going as hard as they could. And then they see the finish line and they sprint. And it's not just the local 5k runners, it's the world record holders. They, they get to the last lap and all of a sudden they can go faster because they know it's going to end. So yeah, n knowing how long it's going to be is, is almost the most important thing that dictate, certainly dictates how you pace yourself and how you experience any prolonged effort. And even the experience of that discomfort, how much of that is driven by the expectations, fears, the novelty of an activity. So if you're, if you're doing uh, this course for the first time or a, a workout for the first time, and you've kind of understood and felt those parameters, it's, you know, from a neurological standpoint, it's kind of like, you, you know, that first time driving and you're 10 o'clock, two o'clock and gripping the wheel. And then by the time you've driven to work for the, you know, uh, a year straight, you don't even remember half the drive there, right? Yeah, I mean your, your your expectations of this of the experience, and your your experience of the experience. So an example I often give is like, let's say you decide to sign up for a five k in three months, and you and and you haven't been running at all, and you get off the couch and you start doing you know a run walk program, and then you progress and blah blah blah. There's oodles of literature on like what is happening to your body. Your heart is getting stronger. You're growing new blood vessels. Blah blah. Your your muscles are, your muscle fibers are changing. We know that the physiology changes, and what we I don't think we appreciate as much is how much your psychology is changing. How much that first day when you when you tried to run for two minutes and you got really out of breath and you felt like you were going to die. You're like, I can't breathe deeply enough. Therefore, I'm about to die. I need to stop right away. Fast forward three months, you've 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 you know gotten accustomed to that feeling. Now you know that heavy breathing it doesn't scare you at all because you know that that just means you're working hard. You you can't sustain that indefinitely, but you're not going to die. And so your ability to kind of hold your finger in that candle flame for longer and longer grows with with your familiarity. And I think I mean a sort of related thing is like you you've got an injury and you don't know what it is, and you're like, oh no, is this the end of my season? Is my leg going to fall off? Uh, you, you, and you just want to know what it is. And you go to the, and if you're lucky, you go to the therapist and like, oh, this is, it's just, you know, tendonitis and it's going to clear up in a week. The exact same pain all of a sudden doesn't bother you at all. You know, it's, it's not that the pain has changed, but you're, you're no longer worried about what it means, the meaning of the, of the discomfort. And so I think that's what, one of the things that people who are experienced with training, whatever the form of, you know, physical training is they develop an arsenal of ways of responding to discomfort other than just, you know, running away screaming. They develop ways of distracting themselves or of reframing it and saying, this discomfort is a sign that I'm doing the workout properly and I'm getting stronger. And, you know, all, all these ways of turning what might be a negative into, if not a positive, then at least a neutral. So you set up the, my next question, talking about kind of the elegance of our human physiology and, and how it comes equipped with these, these natural governors that kind of limits our output to some degree is, is really as a measure of safety. Um, is a large portion of our training uh, specifically for endurance, endurance, just being able to minimize those governors and kind of minimize the restrictive capacity. So yeah, yeah, you know, this is worth unpacking a little bit because this is ultimately the the idea that got me super interested in this topic and got me and you know led me to end up writing a book, or writing a dear about it. Is this idea that when I'm going as hard as I can, when I'm like, you know, I, I'm in a race and I'm you know my arch rival is pulling away from me and I'm going as hard as I can, 
and he's still pulling away from me. That it's not that my body is actually maxed out. It's not that my lactate levels are, you know, we have reached 11 out of 10 on the dial and I simply can't go any farther. It's that on some fundamental level, my brain has decided this is, the, you know, for, for your own good, for your own safety, this is about as hard as you should go right now. And so ultimately it's a decision that I've come as, and this is what you're talking about with, you know, this or what we talk about as a governor. The, there's a, this is an old usage of the word governor. It was coined in the 1920s. The governor not as an, a guy who's elected, you know, to lead the legislature or whatever, but a governor as a, like a thing that's installed on a car to prevent it from going faster than, you know, some certain speed. And, and so we all seem to have some sort of governor that means that no matter how motivated we are, we can't just get up and run until we die. Like this, this almost never happens, which is surprising given how hard people run in, in very hard conditions. We usually run out of will to run before we, you know, keel over and, and die. And so how much of training is pushing back the governor? Some of it, right? uh, but putting a number on it is really hard. And, 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 you know, if you read the jacket copy on my book, uh, there's some sentences like limits are an illusion. And, you know, I, I kind of want to walk that back a little bit. It's like, if I had the choice between having a really fit, well-trained body and a weak mind and a really strong mind in a really weak body and for some athletic competition, I'd rather have the strong body. Like the, 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 you know, the body matters, the physiology matters. Um, but if you're at all competitive or, you, you know, working on, getting close to your your capacities then at a certain point everybody's well trained and everybody has talent and the psycho so the the higher you get on the competitive rung the more it is that yeah it's 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 the psychology that's the difference between the top competitors rather than the, oh his biceps are you know a tenth of an inch bigger than his that's why he won the competition that's it's rarely that so how close are we do you think to to touching our maximum capabilities like you talk about in the book you know what they've done with Nike in in trying to surpass certain markers within the marathon and and within the mile and so forth how how close do you think we are Yeah this is a really interesting question and and you, you can one of the ways you you think about this question is you take let's let's take a sport where there are quantifiable records, like let's take running since this happens to be the sport that I'm most familiar with, but there's a lot of sports that have quantifiable records. Let's plot those records on a curve over time and let's see what's happening. And you see, it's like, wow, there was really steep progress in the 1910s and then medium progress in the 1950s and then not a whole lot of progress in the 1980s. And then you get to you know, the, the present day and it's like, wow, we're pretty close to an asymptote things the, the the line is really leveling off and so every four years as the when the olympics come we, we get these big think pieces saying has humanity uh you know reached its limits have we finally you know set the ultimate records and it you know every time that happens like there were a slate of a, a bunch of those articles in like 2008 and then usain bolt came along and you know took down the men's 100 meters which is like it's if there's one event that's been contested since like 50,000 years ago, it's the men's hundred meters. And he took it down. Like, I can't remember 1.6% or something crazy. He took it down to 9.57 from, you know, 9.8 or so. Um, so people come along and, and shatter these expectations. I think in t if you equalize all the, the external stuff, like, how good are the shoes, which has been a big issue in running in the last few years? How good are the tracks? Uh, how good? Are, how good are the hockey sticks or the baseball bats or the you know the the golf balls? If you equalize all the technical stuff, um, it's getting a lot harder to to make serious progress in in to, you know where it's like oh now we know how to train before we were lying on the couch and thinking that was enough. Now you know, people are training hard, people are training smart. Um, I don't think we'll ever. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there's no more world records. There's always outliers coming along and there's always still innovations in training and, and new ideas, new monitoring technology, you know, new ways of balancing, you know, living on that razor's edge where you're training as hard as you can without overdoing it and getting hurt. Um, so that's a long winded way of, of saying that um, we're, we're, we're pretty close. Like it's, we're, we're pretty close to not what the ultimate capacity of the human body is, but to what, under normal conditions, a human can do in some of the sports we've been doing for a long time, but progress is going to continue. And you know, I know this is a super long answer, but let me just say one other 
thing that I think is really interesting. If you look at horse racing records, horse and dog racing records, those are both sports with a lot of money. Um, and so there's a lot of incentive to use all the latest science and training knowledge to get the fastest horse or the fastest dog possible. Those records have more or less plateaued almost since the you know 1950s or 60s. There's you know occasionally someone comes along like Secretariat and run, goes faster, but then it's like it's not like everyone does. It's just that was a, a, an outlier. So they're not getting a whole bunch faster. Over the same period of time, humans have continued to got to get faster, both over sprints and long distances. And so what's the difference? Why are we using better training for humans than we are for horses or dogs? I, I don't think so. I think what the difference is that when a human is in a race, they they can they can race against the clock. So Secretariat can only race against what whatever other horse is 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 with her, right? So uh, the dog isn't racing against history, but humans are like, well, somebody ran 9.6 for the hundred meters. So that means it's possible to run 9.5. So maybe I can run 9.5 and I'm going to train that way. So I think that's part of what fuels the continuing progress is that there's a kind of ratchet effect where as soon as a human does anything, we know that it's possible for a human to go a little bit faster, a little bit farther, or a little bit stronger. And that kind of fuels that progress. That's awesome. And I, I want to circle back to some of the tech and monitoring stuff. But before we do, one of the things that that's quite ironic um, is the uh, paradox of, of we're talking about pushing capabilities and, 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 and trying to, to get to our maximum. But what gets a lot of, of these top athletes there is not this consistent pedal to the metal training, but rather getting really good at the easy work and, and building efficiencies. Um, and one of the things that stuck out from your book, when you talked about, uh, I think you were at Duke, right. And you saw a lot of the Kenyan runners and they would be running and like laughing and joking as they were running. So now fast forward to now zone two is all the rage in terms of where that fits in. So talk a little bit about how getting good at the easy stuff makes you better at the hard stuff. Yeah. The, the, you know, this, it's, it's funny how things, you know, ideas suddenly penetrate the mass consciousness and you're like, yes, this is what people have been saying all along that. So, and, and it, you know, this happened, let's say 15 years ago in high intensity interval training became all the rage and runners were like, that's how Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile in 1954 is he was doing, you know, short, high intensity intervals. Like, yeah, we, we know that works. And then for a while, you know, in the, in, in the 1960s, there were in fifties and sixties, there were guys doing, who were doing interval training every day, which is what became the rage again, 15 years ago. But then the way it moved on is. By the, night, by the late 60s and the 70s, people realized actually just going hard all the time doesn't max out your, your, uh, your performance. A mix of hard and easy is really the way to go. And so the, the, the model that evolved in endurance sports is often, it's often called polarized training these days. And it, w what it tends to look like, the, there are lots of different ways to train, but the general pattern across endurance sports, whether you're talking rowing, cycling, cross-country skiing, running, is you spend about 80% of your time going re of your training time going really, really easy, like conversational easy, out with out with a friend, out with your friends chatting. Now you're you're getting in some good work there, but you're you're relaxing, you're able to recover. And then about 20% of your time is medium, or you know, maybe the last five percent of it is really, really hard. Um, and so when people start running, often they're like, Yeah, I'm gonna run five days a week. And every one of those five days is miserable because I'm getting out the door and I'm pushing myself. And it's like, wow, it's really hard to push yourself five days a week. And I'm like, yeah, I, I've been running for 30 years and I, I've never done more than two or three, you know, hard workouts a week. And so, so the, like the zone two stuff that's become popular. So, you know, and there's some subtleties to it. Zone two is a little bit harder than zone one, but it's still r relatively easy. And is there magic about zone two? That's, a, that's an open question. It's like zone two really massively better than zone one and zone three. I, I'm skeptical though. I'm open to the idea, but the, the broader picture is the goal is to accumulate a bunch of training stimulus. And you, you, you want to have a recipe that includes some hard stuff and some easy stuff and some medium stuff. And it turns out that if you want to accumulate a lot without getting hurt, getting burned out, getting bored, um, uh, making a large part of that recipe, relatively easy stuff is, is important physically. It's important mentally. And, uh, you know, I think it's a lesson that's, that's hard to learn for people, for beginners or for, for, for novices who think that it, if they want to get good, like the people they see, they need to be always training hard, uh, as opposed to training 
within their limits and and relatively easy for a large and and as you said you know a word you you said before is efficiency that's a super important point that uh, you know if you're pushing yourself all the time you're you're probably developing bad habits bad form uh, and not learning you know the goal is to do as much work as possible with as little effort as possible and so that that's also a big factor yeah, it's 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 uh, you know work of people like uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone talking about his method of of just kind of say okay you're going to go out for this distance and this time and uh, or and, and keep it at this heart rate and let's see if you can just continue to stay at that intensity but cover more ground well you're you're now become more efficient but I guess that the other tough thing is knowing when do I do each one right how do I know when today's the day to go hard today's the day to go easy do I go in between. And so one of the things that's been helpful that's come out is a lot of the tech. And so that's why you being a tech guy, I wanted to ask you about some of these, these technologies and what you see that you like in terms of measuring anything from resting heart rate to HRV to recovery zones and those sorts of things. Is there anything that you see that, that you in particular that you like or find helpful uh, for those people who are confused? I don't know when to do what. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, do you have five or six hours for the answer here? Because we could go deep. <laughs> let's go. Um, okay, so how, let's see. I'm trying to figure out where to start here. Recovery is important. One way, so the way I structure it is my training week is, uh, or let me rewind to 15 years ago when I was training much harder. My training work would be a hard workout Tuesday, a hard workout Thursday, and a medium workout Saturday. And every other day was easy. So that builds in some automatic, hard, easy structure. I'm not trying to do hard work. I'm never, ever trying to do hard workouts on back-to-back -back days. Now, within that, you, you, there's still, you, you, can, you can get pretty tired doing that pattern. And so may, are there days when I wake up on a Thursday morning and I'm like, holy crap, I'm still wiped from Tuesday's workout. And then even though Wednesday was easy, I did go out for you know 70 minutes of running and then did some some circuit training or some resistance training or whatever. Do I need to back off my Thursday workout? How do I know? How do I make that decision? And so these days, there are all sorts of devices that will help you with that decision. They will tell you your recovery score is you know alpha out of omega, whatever. Like you know every every device has a different metric, but you you know you can use Whoop or, or uh, you know Ura or, or your Garmin watch, your Apple watch. They're, they're all they're all trying to answer this question, which is an important one. So, which one works? I I'm I don't love the proprietary recovery scores that a lot of these devices use because because in order to maintain their competitive advantage, they won't actually disclose what exactly goes into the recovery score. So, the, you, you, what you're being told is just trust us. We've we've baked up a nice little recipe for you, and we'll tell you when to go. And that may, you know, if you've got a million people, then for the people in the middle of the the bell curve, that that uh, advice may work per perfectly well. But you know, I, I've certainly heard lots of stories of people who are like, "Yeah, you know, I I did my normal workout, I felt fine, I went for an easy run, and my watch told me I need like two and a half weeks of recovery." So I ignore my watch; like it, it's just not corresponding to reality. What most of these these days, what most of the scores. Our recovery scores are based on, and you can just use the bit, the basic data. Heart rate variability is the big one. Heart rate variability tells you a little bit about the status of your nervous system, the balance between the sort of fight or flight and rest and digest branches of your autonomic nervous system. Um, resting heart rate gives you a little bit more information in uh, about similar things, although not. It's it's a little trickier to interpret. And there, for runners, there are also you know that you can use things like. How, fat, how high was my heart rate at a given speed? So you can have a, a sort of characteristic curve of how, high, how hard your heart beats for a given effort. And you can look at how that curve changes, and that can also tell you how well you're, you're, uh, you're recovered. And there are a bunch of studies that show that if you compare someone who says, who, like you give someone a training plan and you say, follow this training plan for the next month. And you give someone else a, a similar training plan, but you say, every morning you check that heart rate variability or that composite recovery score. And if it's you know going in the wrong direction, you go easier than it says. And if it's in the right zone, you do what it says. And if it's if and, and if it's actually saying you're more recovered than you need, you can go harder than than what it says. And in se in a bunch of these, or, well, let's say several of these studies, people who follow the adaptive training plan do better. So in other words, they they train based on how 
what what the tech is is telling them about how their body is actually feeling rather than just on that piece of paper that someone wrote down a month ago so that on one level is a really good endorsement of the idea of yeah you need to adapt your training based on how well you're recovering and this technology can help you do that my one criticism of that is that the comparison I would like to see is not compare adaptive training to a piece of paper that someone wrote down a month ago. I would like it to compare adaptive training to like what I would call common sense training. That if you wake up and it feels like someone has dropped a load of cement on your legs and you can barely make it to the kitchen, you don't need a heart rate variability test to tell you that you're overtired and you need to back off. And so, and I think this is how a lot of people I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeon here, but in the olden days, this is kind of how people tried to make it work, right? Is is we didn't have heart rate variability, but we did have, I feel like death today, coach. Um, should I really do this whole workout? No, maybe let's push it off till tomorrow. So I think the, te the tech can be really helpful. I guess what my message is, is it, it's not essential. It's it's helpful, but the, the more important thing t to my mind is to be aware that your, your training wasn't handed down from Moses 2000 years ago, and you just need to follow it, you know, like it or not, you, you need to adapt, you need to be aware of how you feel. And in some ways, I would say, learning to tune in to how you're feeling is a maybe an even more powerful and more accurate way of assessing when you're ready to push and when you're not. The, the, the truly great athletes that I've known have amazing intuitive sense of when's a good time to push, and when they just need to sit back in the pack and relax. And, and that's what we all should aspire to, whether or not we use the technology to help us get there. So my brain is percolating and you're absolutely correct. We could go down the rabbit hole of, you know, auto regulation for probably the next two days. But um, I, I think one of the challenges I found, because I've experimented with my clients with just about every one of these devices, is that getting them to understand to not look at any score in a silo is that just because you had a low score today, it's not reflective of what happened in the last eight, 12, 24 hours. It's kind of a, a cumulative type of thing. Um, and that, so you don't have to immediately, you know, go back and hide under the covers. If you have a low score, you're, and yet you're actually supposed to have low scores. That's the undulating progress of, of what you should see of challenging yourself and coming back a little bit stronger. But the other thing is getting them to understand the other factors and the awareness of lifestyle uh, of how that, that impacts it. And, and so in your book, you, you raise some some doubt on some of the dogmatic beliefs when it comes to nutrition and, and, and fueling for endurance athletes, whether it's protein requirements or the old carb bloating thing or, or, or so forth, uh, doing your research, what, what are some of the things that stood out, you know, when you're looking at stuff for the book, some of the most common beliefs and practices that, that didn't make sense when you match it up against what, you know, what the science shows. Yeah. You, you know, the, the actual start of this book for me, that what the research that made me realize, oh, some of my assumptions are wrong, was there was a debate in the, I think it was the Journal of Applied Physiology in about 2006, 2007. It was a point counterpoint debate between two scientists on dehydration hurts endurance performance or dehydration does not hurt endurance performance. And I was like, this is in the Journal of Applied Physiology? Who, who's arguing that dehydration doesn't hurt endurance performance? And it was a guy named Tim Noakes who, who turns out to be a, um, let's say, uh, a contrarian, uh, a born contrarian. And uh, I, I, don't, I, I should say, I don't think he's right all the time, but I think he's had some very uh, astute criticisms of the, the things we assume. And so one of the things he pointed out is like, if you really dissect the dehydration research, th there's actually not a ton of evidence that being like 2% dehydrated harms your performance. Being thirsty harms your performance. If you're put in a, a, in a study where you're not allowed to drink, and you're a little bit dehydrated. That's there's no doubt that's bad, but your body has an ability to adjust its fluid stores, you know, within the body, and it can handle a bit of dehydration as, as long. And it's really it's the sensation of being thirsty that 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 causes you to slow down because it makes it feel like it's harder. If you're being if you're if you if you're a little bit thirsty and you can't drink, that's a problem. If you're a little bit thirsty and you can drink, then you're probably going to be fine. If, even if you're just mildly dehydrated. Anyway, so dehydration was the was the ball, got the ball rolling for me. But you know, you alluded to a bunch of other things. Um, certainly, the uh, over the last decade, the thing that was probably the biggest debate in endurance physiology was was low carb, high fat diets, ketogenic diets. And I certainly, if you'd asked me, if we'd had this conversation ten years ago, I would have said, you know, please don't 
don't waste my time telling me that you can run a decent marathon if, if you're eating no carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are what the, the fuel is for endurance sports. Um, I, I just wouldn't have believed that it's possible to run anywhere near your best um, on a ketogenic diet. And uh, the data says otherwise, you know, like uh, certainly there was lots of anecdotes and I was like, well, anecdotes are, are, are cheap. Then they, they tested it in the lab and it's like, yeah, actually people can run pretty, a pretty good marathon on a ketogenic diet. And that tells us something pretty, some pretty important things about the, the way the body fuels endurance sports and the way it's possible to approach endurance sports. Now, does a ketogenic diet or ketogenic diet, you're running on fat. The body always has tons of fat. So it's like, man, I can keep going forever without fuel. Does this make you a better marathoner? My my personal opinion based on uh, uh, you know, my reading of the research would be, no, it, it doesn't make you better. It might be helpful for some people in longer events. Let's say if we're getting to five, six, seven, eight hours, you know, Ironman triathlons. Um, if you're for a marathon, if it's going to take you three hours, it's probably not going to make you better. If you're well adapted, it probably won't make you much worse either. It'll be pretty much a wash uh, in, 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 you know, for most people within a few percent. That, you know, that may seem like a wishy-washy statement, but it's a huge change from what I would have said a decade ago. And it was, you know, uh, ch changing your mind can be challenging, right? Because we all have our, you know, our egos tied up with our current beliefs. And so it it really required looking at the data and saying, oh, actually, it turns out people can run a marathon on a keto diet. Hey, everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. And then another thing that stands out from the book is that makes it, you know, I would imagine this whole conversation a lot more difficult is that the, the nutrient hydration requirements kind of vary wildly from one individual to another. And it makes a lot of the common standards of, you know, the eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day and the old other wives tales that we've been taught, you know, for all these years, a lot more difficult. So that makes it even more confounding. And so if you're the weekend warrior running your 5Ks or the occasional, you know, longer races and you don't have a sports science team, how do you figure out like what do I even need here? Yeah, it's confusing for sure. And you know, I I feel guilty sometimes. I'm writing, I, you know, I'm writing articles for Runs World or Outside Magazine and it's like it does feel like every week it's like, oh, forget what we said last week. It's now the opposite. Um and and so I th I think that the theme that I would emphasize is, and it fits with what we were talking about before with recovery too. It's it's learning to listen to your own body because, like you said, like some people sweat four liters an hour, some people max out at less than one liter an hour. Um, so you tell someone you tell someone who's a light sweater to drink as much as a heavy sweater, they're going to end up over drinking and having hyponatremia. It's very hard to have like a a schedule that isn't personalized. And, and I'm not sure it's really practical or desirable to say, well, then everyone should go in and find a hydration lab and have their sweat tested. And, uh, you know, that can be useful for some people, but I think the, the more useful thing is just to experiment and to start to get a sense of what it feels like to be thirsty, what it feels like to be not thirsty, what it feels like to be hungry or low on energy and, and what sorts of things your, your stomach can tolerate. So if someone, if someone is going out to run a 5k or 10k or a marathon, I would say, well, for a 5k, I'd say, don't even, don't even worry about drinking. You're not, you know, you'll be thirsty at the end. That's fine. Then you'll drink. It's not going to affect your performance. Um, almost I'd say the same. I, I certainly don't drink at anything, anything that takes less than an hour. Um, I, I wouldn't bother drinking beyond that. I drink when I'm thirsty. Um, and if you're out there for a long time, Drinking when you're thirsty doesn't just mean when you notice that your tongue is like stuck to the roof of your mouth. You have to be sort of proactively aware of, and this is this is I think a thing that a lot of us struggle with in in the modern world, right? Is we're kind of we we live to a schedule rather than to our our sense. You know, we eat breakfast at eight and lunch at twelve or whatever, as opposed to eating when we're hungry. And there's positives to that, but we've sometimes got disconnected from the feeling of my body needs fluids or my body needs fuel. And so th that's where I would, I would point people is, I, I, and, and I would add that the, the fears of dehydration, certainly from the 90s, were overblown. And even just outside of sport, the, like you said, the eight glasses of water a day, it's like, 
if you're drinking when you're thirsty and if you're making sure to check in with yourself and and figure out if you are thirsty then you're going to be fine fuel fuels a little more fuel it's harder to give general rules about like eating because it depends on the activity like the, there's different advice if you're competing in a crossfit com competition compared to if you're competing in a marathon so the 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 you know whether you need protein or carbs or what, what your personal uh dietary approach is all, all those things can vary a lot but the the common theme is no, notice when you feel good notice when you feel bad ask yourself what what did i do that when in the time i felt good versus the time i felt bad you know i, I really hope that some of the parents uh, that are in the world that i work in so i, I do a lot of work with, with baseball alex and, and so uh i hope all the parents are listening that little joey does not need a Gatorade just because he ran 60 feet to first base. Um, <laughs> you can stay in your bleachers. You don't need to run to the snack bar. Um, so we talk about some essential stuff like, like nutrients and hydration. The most essential thing we do as a human being is breathe. And we're talking about cardiorespiratory uh, fitness and, and so forth. Breathing would, would obviously be something we want to leverage. And, you know, we teach in our courses, there's different types of breathing depending on what the activity is. So, uh, talk a little bit about anything that you've come across that, that certain athletes, especially on the endurance side have leveraged in terms of using breathing to their advantage. Yeah. You know, there, there was a great, uh, big meta analysis, a review by, uh, it was led by a team. It was led by, uh, it was by a big team. I think the senior author was a guy named Nick Tiller at UCLA. Um, and he, he published this big review of breathing interventions, just saying, let's look at the evidence. Let's figure out what works and, and, and what doesn't for, you know, various breathing related things to improve performance. Um, and it, it was interesting because there's a mix of, of, you know, obvious pseudoscience, uh, and good science. And then in the middle, there's a lot of stuff that's really hard to, um, you know, it's not, it, it, there's real effects there. And the question is, it, it's very hard to show whether it works because the thing is with, as when you change your breathing, breathing pattern, you're not just changing how much oxygen is going to your muscles, right? You're changing your 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 stress levels. You're changing your the, the arousal level in your in your nervous system. And so these things, in some ways, by some definition, you might call them placebo effects. But it's like, but no, but that's what we're trying to do. We were trying to the, the whole point of that breathing was to get you in a calmer space so you can perform better. So it's it becomes very hard to sort of make scientific pronouncements about this worked and that didn't work. You can say like taking canned oxygen on the sidelines of a football game is a waste of time and, 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 and doesn't do anything. Um, on the endurance side, doing training your breathing muscles does seem to have an effect. It's a small effect and it's hard work to get it. But if, so when you're breathing heavily, like in, in endurance sports, you're breathing heavily, you, you're using muscles to, to, you know, pump your lungs, pump air in and out, in and out of your lungs. And those muscles, they can consume up to, I think it's 20% of the the oxygen that you're taking in are just going to the work of breathing. And so if you can make those muscles stronger and a little more efficient, you can save uh, some of that energy that you're, you're w not wasting, but you're using on breathing. And so there's these, it's, it's like it, these devices, there's a whole bunch of them, but they, they basically usually look like a kazoo and you're sort of, you're, you're practicing um, sucking in. It's the inspiratory breathing muscles that tend to fatigue the most, the ones that are involved in, in, in inhaling. And there's there's evidence that the, these seem to work for enhancing endurance performance in some contexts. Now, probably the most hot topic I would say in the last few years is is the idea of nasal breathing. Um, and there's there's a lot of sort of health related stuff to do with nas nasal breathing and the way it the way it uh, impacts the the uh, well the the you're filtering the air so the air is moist, more moist as it comes in and it seems to also have effects on the autonomic nervous system so the question is should you be running with nasal breathing now my personal approach to breathing while running is uh is the same as there's a famous new zealand coach named arthur lydiard who kind of revolutionized endurance training in the 1960s um he is New Zealand, tiny little country, won a whole bunch of gold medals at the 1964 Olympics. And someone asked him, you know, should I be breathing through my mouth or through my nose? And his answer was, hey, if you can take an oxygen through your ears, you should be breathing in through your ears too. Just, you know, do whatever it takes to get as much air in as possible. And I think for most people when they're running, um, it's that's good advice. I mean, not that we can breathe through our ears, but it's good advice to just like, 
your body's going to take up, you're, you're going to be in enough oxygen debt that your body is going to, uh, you know, take over the breathing. You know, you don't need to think about when you're breathing it, breathing in and out. You're, you're just going to be breathing in as much as you need and out as much as you need. Now, one potential advantage of the nasal breathing thing is goes back to something we we're talking about earlier. It's like you're supposed to be going easy most of the time. And so one way of enforcing easy training on the days when you're trying to go easy is breathe only through your nose because you can't go very fast. Well, well, if well, well, just nasal breathing because you can't get enough oxygen in. Now, I don't think the personally, I don't think the nasal breathing um, makes you a faster runner. But it, and there are other ways of going slow, which is like running with a friend or whatever, or just deciding not to go too fast. But nasal breathing can be useful in that sense as a way of controlling intensity on the days when you're supposed to be easy. And it certainly is something that you get better at with training. Um, but I, I remain to be convinced that it's like uh, you know qualitatively better than uh, you know a better way of getting oxygen in all right so as we, we start to wind things down in the book is a really elegant way of kind of breaking it into the pieces of you know oxygen and fuel and muscle and so forth and now we have people who are getting more engaged uh in in trying to learn more and trying to get uh healthier more fit more so than i think you know when i started off it was hey if i go out for a run it was just kind of like i just run i don't have much purpose i don't have much thought to it there wasn't monitoring of things like hrv there wasn't a lot of the information that we have now available but that information also is also extremely overwhelming so if you have someone that that wants to go through and and, and kind of take it to the next level of, of fitness, not to whether they're, they're going to be an Olympian or anything like that. But if they say, okay, well, what's the checklist of things that you need to really consider? And you talked about labs before, like how important is it for someone to know their VO2 max, to know their lactate threshold, those sorts of things. Like if you had a checklist for that, that a uh, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, above average, or that real, that real fitness enthusiast that, that we seem to have now that you might not have had 20 years ago, and they want to get a checklist of, okay, what's the important stuff and what's the fringe stuff I don't need to worry about? What's kind of the big, you know, four or five things that you would say for that person that they should really know about themselves to get to the next level? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I mean, so Peter Atia has a, a book that came out recently that, and he's, he's a big proponent of like, here are the, you need to be able to hang from a bar for this long and you need to have, to be able to run for this, you know, get your VO2 max at this percentile for this age. Um, and I think you're, you're right that, that that approach definitely appeals to, to a, a certain type of person. Um, and, and, you know, everyone, everyone responds to different motivators. Um, for me, so just for some context, I, as you, as you mentioned at the top, I, I was a physics guy initially. I was so I'm definitely like a data guy. And in the nineties, when data was scarce, I spent a lot of time like manually checking my pulse when I woke up and, and then getting up 15 seconds after I got up and checking my pulse again, look, plotting the difference in Lotus one, two, three to try and look for trends. So I like data so much that I'm aware that it becomes an obsession with me. And so I actually, I'm fairly data averse now. I don't, I don't run with a GPS watch. I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not on Strava. I don't keep any, a training log. Um, I don't, I haven't had a VO2 max test in years. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm cautious about these things, uh, because for me, I would say like, what, what is the number one fitness goal for me five years from now? It's to still be doing what I'm doing. Right. Like, so it's, it's the continuity of, of engagement. And so I'm very conscious of trying to arrange things in a way that keeps it enjoyable for me rather than stressful. Now, not everyone is obsessive as me, so they don't necessarily need to, to be, uh, on the lookout for these sorts of things. But so I don't like, honestly, I don't think people need to know their VO2 max. I, I don't think people need to know, um, you know, their, their body fat percentage or their, you know, I think it can be beneficial for some people. Uh, so for some people it's motivating and it's, and it's probably the most important part of the data is if it gives you a benchmark to strive for, and it gets you motivated to do the work in the gym, then that's more important than the specific number. Because ultimately it's like in running, there's, there, there's various philosophies of training. And one of them is like, you have to know your goal pace and your date pace. And you do some workouts at your goal, at your date pace, which is how how fit you'd be, how fast you could run your race today. And you do other workouts at your goal pace, which is how fast you want to run, be able to run next spring. 
And to me, the goal pace approach has never made much sense because it's like the universe doesn't care what your goals are. The universe cares what you are right now and your physiology. Like you, you need to be, you need to start where you are and try and get better than that. And so there may be quantifiable things. So for me, the way I keep track of my aerobic fitness these days is I make sure to at least once a year, I run a 5k. A 5k is a very good bent, a very good proxy for VO2 max. And so I run that every year and I run it as hard as I can. And that gives me a reality check of like, okay, I made some changes in my fitness this year. I started playing basketball and skipped a couple runs, you know, weekly or like I, whatever changed, did it have a big effect on my fitness? Yes or no. And if it did, if, if, if I lost some fitness, then I need to rethink whether I need to do something else. And I have, uh, you know, I do as part of my, uh, like resistance training, I, I do things like push ups and pull ups. And I, I'm very careful when I do them to, to do them, uh, with proper form and through a full range of motion. Um, not because I think that the, it really matters whether I can do that last, you know, 10 degrees, but because I want to be able to compare, I want to know that if three years ago I could do sets of eight and now, now I can do sets of six, that tells me something, or maybe I can do sets of 10 or whatever. Um, I, I, so I do want to have some comparison of where I am relative to where I was yesterday. But I, I'm I'm less concerned with the with with external benchmarks. Although, look, I mean, it's it's not a bad idea to know, and there are ways of looking it up. I don't I don't have like a sense of how fast everyone should run five k because it depends on your age, your your your, your sex, um, and and realistically depends on you know aspiring to run faster than someone else who has different capabilities than you. Like, I I am never gonna hit the the strength benchmarks that that someone who has a, uh, has some muscles on their on their body is, are are going to hit, and conversely, they're probably never going to hit the the endurance bar, bench, benchmarks that I can hit. And so, it's not worth getting too worked up about, um, w- you know, where I fit on the population scale. Now we'll we'll wrap up with where you wrap up the book and talking about the motivation, and and so we have this. This strange dichotomy, especially now that's been, I think, exacerbated uh, after the pandemic. And I talk about it in the course because in what we deal with as trainers and coaches or even physical therapists that I'm teaching is that you have these kind of two different populations that that are coexisting out there. Um, and so if they come into the PT clinic or they come into me, you know, looking to work out, I say there's there's we're at this crossroads between fragile and broken. You have these people who are fragile who who really are extremely sedentary, especially because they're working from home, they don't do really anything. And so they're, you know, they're just disintegrating. And that's why they're so fragile. And then on the other side, you have this, this drive towards extreme activities that we didn't have 20, 25 years ago, where you didn't have the, the, the rise of CrossFit, and you didn't have tough mutters, and you didn't have uh, 100 mile endurance races being nearly as popular as they are today. So both of those people come in with a sore shoulder, they can't get treated the same. And so about motivation on either side of those is kind of fascinating in terms of how do we deal with those as trainers, as coaches, or even if you are one of those people like that, that motivation to where the brain fits in of all this and the psychology of it. So if you could kind of wrap up with like where motivation for, for exercise kind of gets driven from and, and some of the, the, the variability that we can have or things that are trainability that we have within that. Yeah. And I think that motivation question is really the, I mean, it's, it's, you know, going back to the last question, it's like more important than the, the, the data or the benchmarks is the why is figuring out what it is for you personally, that is going to be a sustainable source of motivation. And now for some people at some stages of their life, like for me in my twenties, all I cared about was, could I run 1500 meters you know, a 10th of a second faster than I'd done before. And that was enough to get me out the door, uh, for as many hours as my body could handle, uh, for, for, for better or worse. And it's different now. So for, for me, my motivations are much more oriented about like, what's, what's my day-to-day life going to be like in 20 or 30 years. And I think that's a question that can speak to both these populations, right? Like the, the person who's sedentary, they need to ask themselves what, what am I willing to do now to make sure that, you know, 20 years from now, my life isn't just absolutely miserable and off the rails because I can't get off, off the couch and I can't, 
you know, sustain the activities of daily living. But the same is true for the person running the hundred mile race. Uh, you know, if you love competition and if you love pushing yourself, um, if you break yourself, you know, I, I, I know I, or I've, I've met a fair number of aging athletes who can't do the sport that they love anymore because they ignored the warning signs and, you know, and sometimes I don't want to put the blame on, on, on them entirely. Like sometimes bodies break down for, for no reason, but, um, the, for pulling back from the edge is sometimes the, the motivation for that may have to be not because someone's telling you to do it, but because you realize, look, um, I want to be active. I want to be having fun and having adventures when I'm 75, uh, or, or when I'm, I, one of my friends just played pickleball. I'm in my mid or late forties, let's say one of my friends just played pickleball with his dad, who's 81 and he's an age group champion in pickleball. And his dad smoked him. He only got like six points. The the son only got six points off his dad. And, and he said, I, I think I only got the six points because he wasn't really taking me seriously. And as soon as I heard that, it's like, that's what I want to be when I'm 81. I, I want to be smoking my kids in some physical activity. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm rambling off the point here. But yeah, for motivation, I, I, I think it's to zoom out and to, 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 as much as I love training for a hard race that's two months from now, uh, for me, the, the, what helps me keep my training in context and keep it balanced so that I'm not just doing running, which is what I love, but keeping it balanced is the thought of what's it going to be like 20 years or 30 years or what, however many years from now. Incredible. I could break your brain all day, but, but, uh, I want to find out, uh, what's next, what's, what's new on the horizon and what do you have coming up, uh, as your latest project house? The big thing I'm working on these days, I'm, I'm working on another book. Uh, this one is on exploring why, why we explore in the sense that, you know, if endure was about, um, how we push our limits explores, why, why we push our limits. Um, it was due four months ago, but I'm still a long way from done. It's taken me longer than I expected. It's a, it's a big topic. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting research out there. So I'm uh, sort of deep in the hole with that one. It'll be a while before it makes the break of day, but that, that's what I'm spending my time on. Well, keep us posted because I can't wait to get it. I've, I've loved your work. And uh, I want to thank you again for being on. I want to thank everyone for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance podcast. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.